The Leadership Alliance is transformative. It is effective. It's important. Leadership Alliance is a catalyst. A professional family. It's a career builder. An opportunity. An incredible opportunity. It brings together the best people. It brings together the best ideas. The Leadership Alliance is family that uh, looks out for you. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. It's groundbreaking. Without Leadership Alliance, I wouldn't be where I am right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Leadership Alliance's first ever Virtual Leadership Alliance National Symposium. I am Dr. Medeva Gee, the Executive Director of the Leadership Alliance and an Associate Professor of the Practice of Behavioral and Social Sciences here at Brown University. And I bring you greetings from Rhode Island, a state whose history is preceded by and interwoven with indigenous history. We are all connected and we must honor and recognize the contributions of our First Nations. Although we're meeting today on this virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and pay respect to the Narragansett and the Wampanoag peoples who are the traditional custodians of the land on which Brown University, the founding institution of the Leadership Alliance resides. This recognition is so important as it allows us an opportunity to reflect upon and affirm our commitment to equity, inclusion, and justice. To join me in welcoming you to our symposium is the chair of the Symposium Planning Committee, Dr. Don C. Brunson, who also serves as the Assistant Dean of the Graduate School and Director of Enhancing Diversity in Graduate Education Program, or VU EDGE, at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Brunson. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Don Brunson. Uh, as Dr. Uh, D said, I am the Assistant Dean in the Vanderbilt University Graduate School. On behalf of the Leadership Alliance National Symposium Planning Committee and the Leadership Alliance National Symposium 25 Committee, known as the LANDS 25 Committee, I welcome our undergraduate scholars, graduate scholars, doctoral scholars, faculty mentors, institutional coordinators, summer program coordinators, other summer program staff members, Alliance Executive Office staff members, family members of our scholars, and friends of the Alliance to our special virtual conference for 2020, 2020 the Virtual Lands or VLANS. The members of the Leadership Alliance Symposium Planning Committee, Ms. Ernestine Baker of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Dr. Geneva Baxter of Spelman College, Dr. Arnaldo Diaz from the University of Pennsylvania, Perlman School of Medicine, Dr. Vanessa Gonzalez Perez from the Princeton University Graduate School, Dr. Jawanda Grant, formerly of Xavier University of Louisiana and currently with the Oak Ridge uh, National Research Laboratories, Dr. Edgardo Sanabria Valentin from John Jay College, and last and certainly not least, Ms. Maria Doval from the Leadership Alliance Executive Office are delighted that you are with us for this virtual conference. And we hope that you and your loved ones are safe and well during this difficult period. Nine months ago, we never imagined that this would be the format for our national symposium, our signature summer activity, but here we are today. As we do every year and as we will continue to do, we are gathered to acknowledge and celebrate the legacy and contribution of past scholars through their storytelling, as well as the accomplishment of our present scholars through their research. Our young scholars have worked diligently this summer and are eager to share with you the results of their work through poster and oral presentations. Please attend as many of these presentations as you're able to and show your support for our scholars. Today, tomorrow, and Saturday, we hope that all of our presentations and activities will nourish you emotionally psychologically and intellectually. That is why we host LANS. With your continued support, we will remain Alliance Strong. Thank you for joining us. And again, do enjoy our virtual conference. Thank you so much, Dr. Brunson. Thank you for your leadership and for your ongoing support of the Leadership Alliance. Now, you may have heard that Dr. Brunson mentioned the LANS 25 Alumni Committee 
Well, that's because we were going to be celebrating a 25th anniversary. The first Leadership Alliance National Symposium was held in Washington, DC in 1995 with approximately 350 participants. And this year marks the 25th consecutive year that we've been hosting this event. As it has grown, LANS has remained the Leadership Alliance's keystone event, a space for summer research early identification program students or our SREIP students to present their research, a continuum of mentoring efforts for students who have progressed into or completed their doctoral degrees, and a networking opportunity for participants from across the Leadership Alliance Consortium. And we are delighted today to have one of the Leadership Alliance founding coordinators to share reflections on this momentous occasion. Um, it's Dr. Joel Oppenheim. I know him as Joel, as he was my graduate advisor when I was at NYU School of Medicine, getting my PhD in microbiology. Dr. Oppenheimer Joel is the Professor Emeritus of Microbiology at NYU School of Medicine. And he really is one of the pillars of the Leadership Alliance. Many of our graduate students and our doctoral scholars know him as a surrogate father, a mentor, and a friend. And I am so glad to call him all of the above. And I'm so glad that he always answers the call to serve when the Leadership Alliance calls upon him. And because he was around at the very beginning, we invited him to give reflections on the first Leadership Alliance National Symposium. Take it away, Joel. And please unmute yourself. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Medeva. It, it's my great pleasure to welcome you, all the participants to the 25th anniversary of the Leadership Alliance National Symposium. There's over 600 of you present for this event, which as Medeva told you, considering this is virtual and our first event had only 350 people live. So it just gives you an idea how much the alliance has grown um, over, over the last 25 years. Um, 2020 lands, uh, which begins today, is celebrating its 25th continuous year of significantly impacting the lives of over thousands of participants through its unique programming of research presentations, informational and inspirational talks, and discussions, mentoring, and networking opportunities. LANS was the basis of the original establishment, is based on the original establishment of the Leadership Alliance in 1992, which was to develop underrepresented students into outstanding leaders and role models in academia, business, and the public sector, which had sorely been lacking at that time. To give you a brief historical perspective, LANS, as Medeva told you, began in 1995 and was held in Washington, D.C. at the National Academy of Sciences, a rather auspicious place to hold the first meeting. It was brainchild of Dr. James Weish, who was the founding executive director of Leadership Alliance and then also associate provost at Brown University. The first keynote speaker was Dr. Bruce Alperts, um, an internationally known molecular biologist and then president of the National Academy. The format for that first LANS was very similar to the, that plan for this year's LANS, surprisingly, a bit on site rather than visual. It should be known that several of the organizers and coordinators at this year's LANS were undergraduate and graduate participants. Um, at that first meeting, including Dr. Medeva Gee, um, the present Executive Director of Leadership Alliance, and Dr. Arnaldo Diaz, who is a student at that time at UPenn, uh, but now is a, a um, faculty at, um, at UPenn uh, and runs their summer program. In closing, I wish you all a productive meeting and continued academic and personal success. And in, in these uncertain times, please stay healthy. Thank you, Medeva. Thank you so much, Joel. Thank you so much for sharing this perspective. Um, thank you for all your service. Thank you for your 
dedication, commitment to the Leaders for Lions. Um, I feel as though with you, with Dr. Weish, with the former president of Brown University, Bartan Gregorian at the time, we are indeed standing on the shoulders of giants. You have given us a blueprint for us to move forward. And based on that, even in the wake of a global health pandemic, it made us realize that we were not going to falter. And in the midst of a national cultural crisis that continues to shake our country to its core and lay bare systemic anti-Black racism and chronic social and economic injustices for marginalized people, we came together as a community. We continue to come together as a community, as a family, to turn pain into purpose and become agents of change. Thanks to all of your work, Joel, and all of our coordinators, our founding coordinators, our existing coordinators, we have been able to remain steadfast in our resolve to mentor, train, and inspire students from across the country by moving forward with the virtual summer research program and by creating a new virtual professional development program. And in all, our outreach and innovative programming has reached more than 800 undergraduates this summer, spanning across the country from Hawaii to Puerto Rico. And for our students in Puerto Rico who are dealing with another storm, estamos contigo. Uh, but this doubles our cohort from last year and we could not do this without the support of the Leadership Alliance community and family. A remarkable community of faculty, mentors, institutional and summer program coordinators from the Leadership Alliance network of more than 30 colleges and universities are responsible for this Herculean effort. Within a short period of time, a three month time frame, our faculty members had adapted their research projects to accommodate remote learning and Leadership Alliance coordinators formed working groups to help shape the development of our professional development series so that no one student would be left behind. So to all of our faculty mentors and Alliance administrators, our institutional coordinators, as you can see, these are all of our logos of our institutions on this slide. Please know that I am truly grateful for your service and for your commitment to our shared vision of building a diverse research workforce. And to all of the family members and friends who supported our students during these unsettling times as they poured over academic texts, data sets, and joined Zoom meetings throughout the day, we thank you for your commitment to their education. For the late Nelson Mandela said, and I quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. We know that many of you many of the family members and friends who are still working on the front lines of the pandemic. So we want you to know how much we appreciate all that you do, all that you are doing, and we thank you for your service. I also want to take time to acknowledge and thank all of the graduate student mentors, all of those who are now in the process of pursuing their PhDs at various institutions across the country. They have been serving as study group leaders over the summer, and they will be moderating oral and posted presentations over the weekend. And so as a near peer mentor, their giving back is paying it forward. So to all of our graduate students, study group leaders and moderators, we thank you for taking time from your research to serve in these varied capacities. And it has been my privilege to work with a team who carries out the administrative responsibilities of the Leadership Alliance with dedication and purpose. And so I want to acknowledge my team. First, Dr. Thais Bingham Hickman, who is our Associate Director and fellow resident doctor, doctoral scholar. Uh, Samantha Anderson, who is the brainchild and organizer of the summer research program and the professional development program at the very end of this slide, um, who is the coordinator for undergraduate programs. Um, Dr. William Whittles, who is our program manager, and last but not least, Ms. Maria Duval, who is our conference and event specialist and the administrative mastermind of VLAN. And 
So providing the platform to make all of this happen are my colleagues in the Brown University Media Services team. Their active engagement has been promoting meaningful and memorable conversations throughout the summer. So we thank them for their expertise and their spirit of collegiality. And last but not least, I want to thank all of the students who have joined this webinar to kick off VLANs, but all of you who've been participating in the virtual summer research early identification program, all of you who've been taking advantage of the virtual professional development program, thank you so much for your willingness to join us on this extraordinary journey of exploration, experimentation, and innovation. This was not easy, and yet you persevered. I applaud you for your collective resilience, tenacity, and creativity. And the latter is documented in our virtual roll call. Now, this is where we have students who are participating in the summer research experience talk about where they're from or represent where they're from. And at LANS, we do this in person and we're able to highlight all of the institutions. On this virtual platform, we decided to leverage the creativity of students who participated in the virtual summer research early identification program at the various host research sites. And so you will see now the virtual roll call, which we have provided the opportunity for students to represent their host summer research programs in very creative ways. Let's watch the video. <laughs> this is something serious. That Are you know, gonna, we're all we're all gonna pop up together. On oh, okay. Oh, so I got the <laughs> room. Oh, my God. oh yeah, you're right. Oh, that's so smart. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just cover your well, webcam. I didn't turn into a field for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> P. 
E. N. N. Wharton. Wharton. W. E. I. L. L. C. O. R. N. L. L. Well, Cornell. Wow, Cornell. Wow, Cornell. Wow, Cornell. <laughs> we are investigators. Resilient. Researchers. Intelligent. Future physician scientists. Nosotros somos diversos. We are diverse. Exceptional. Activists. Capable. Future double dogs. We are passion. Leaders. Advocates. Mentors. We are the future of medicine. We are Davis all of the students and again program directors for putting together this virtual roll call that allowed us our students to represent from their research sites that was wonderful and it just attests to the creativity of our students and it also warms the heart that although we were not able to connect in person we were able to connect virtually so i love seeing all the smiling faces and i'm so impressed when i think about the research that's been conducted and that will be discussed and shared tomorrow i'm so impressed as to all that you are going to be able to talk about based on what you have accomplished during this exceptional summer and throughout the summer all of our partner institutions played a distinctive role in creating a space for students to become change agents. So we actually had you in mind when we came up with the theme of the symposium, which is becoming change agents, one voice, no boundaries. And as I reflect on this theme, I'm inspired by the words of the late Congressman John R. Lewis, who was laid to rest earlier today. And he says, Speaking atop the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama on March 1st, 2020, he says, and I quote, getting good trouble, necessary trouble, and help redeem the soul of America. In order to affect change in an increasingly multicultural society, we need you, we need all of you to stay true to who you are, to embrace your cultural heritage and allow your diverse experiences, perspectives and ideas to enrich your scholarship and your research and to be able to get in good trouble by speaking out and being able to speak out from those diverse perspectives. So I encourage you with the support of the Leadership Alliance community to unite our collective and creative voices to inform actionable strategies for change. And this is something that the Leadership Alliance is committed to do after the summer program and throughout your entire academic pathway. For we believe that a continuum of mentorship leads to a legacy of scholars. And so the legacy of the Leadership Alliance is embodied in our esteemed alumni who are fulfilling our mission as outstanding leaders and role models in all career sectors, in academia, the private and public sectors. These are our doctoral scholars. These are those who have participated in the Leadership Alliance Summer Research Early Identification Program and successfully navigated their academic paths to obtain a PhD or MD-PhD degree. And to date, we have 
582 doctoral scholars. So over the summer, we've kept them busy. We've been putting them to work as role models. They have been sharing their personal and professional trajectories and the conversations with the doctoral scholar series, a component of the virtual professional development program. So back by popular demand, we have recruited a wonderful group of doctoral scholars and tasked them to serve in a slightly different capacity today. So for the purpose of VLANs, we are taking a storytelling approach and we have asked each of them to share advice and encouragement to the young people they once were, almost like a note to self. So I invite you to listen in as our doctoral scholars share their stories of becoming change agents by standing up for what is right, engaging in critical conversations about race and identity, and mentoring the next generation of scholars. The moderator for the session is Dr. Thais Bingham-Hickman, again, the Associate Director of the Leadership Alliance and our resident doctoral scholar um, who will introduce the speakers and who will lead us in these wonderful stories. Dr. Thais Bingham-Hickman, take it away. Thank you so much, Madeva. And I am so excited to be here um, and to be working with the Leadership Alliance as Medeva mentioned, I am also a fellow Leadership Alliance alumni, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, whom I've had the opportunity to actually attend graduate school with. Um, so Dr. Paloma Vargas, PhD, who is uh, Assistant Professor of Biology and Director of Hispanic Serving Institute Initiatives at California Lutheran University. Um, so thank you so much, Paloma, and we are all excited to hear your story. So please, with that, let's hear it. Thank you, Thais. Uh, if we can get the slides up, thank you. Um, so we were asked to do this as a, a letter to self, um, and I'm hoping I can do it justice. Um, let's go on and, and go ahead and start on that next slide. So Paloma, this was you at age one. I don't think you would have thought being an El Paso, Texas, born and raised kid in this beautiful mountainous city that you would be where you are right now, speaking to this wonderful group of scholars. You grew up in a binational, uh, multiracial uh, community that served you well. Puedes hablar en español, you can speak in English, you can speak in Spanish and uh, being raised here um, had really set you up to be successful. This is where uh, you started at community college, um, thinking that you were gonna be a medical doctor uh, and then transitioning to the University of Texas El Paso to complete your, uh, your bachelor's degree. Um, if we move on to the next slide, you'll see that um, what, um, came next was a series of opportunities. Um, your education has allowed you to do things like research monarch butterflies, um, look into the effects of plasmodium, the causative agent for malaria, um, and present that uh, work at the Leadership Alliance uh, way back in 2003. Um, you were able to then be a Leadership Alliance participant and um, look at the genetics of yeast. Um, and while your dreams of becoming a medical doctor will, were still around, you began to think more and more about what a research career would be like. Um, you became an active member of the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science during this time. And it was during your undergraduate career that you really decided um, that maybe being a physician that doesn't like to touch people uh, would not be a good thing. And that um, uh, becoming a researcher was really where your heart was. Uh, you studied the behavior of ants um, and all of this uh, experience really led you to make a decision to go to grad school. Um, but what was really, uh, I think, the most important piece for you to know is that the two men on the next slide were really the ones that were pivotal to who you would become um, on 
my left, you'll see Joel Oppenheim, who spoke with you just a few minutes ago. Um, and on your right, uh, it's a picture of me with uh, my first research mentor, uh, Nick Lanuti, who actually um, passed from complications of COVID in April. These two men uh, would change your life forever. Nick got you started in research in that butterfly lab. Um, and you met Joel at a conference where he told you that you could do more than what you had aspired to be. You could go on, you could go to grad school, and you could change things for people just like you. And you have. Um, your science uh, career has taken you to uh, complete your doctoral degree at NYU, a decision that you will be grateful for um, to this day and you will be happy to have been uh, a Suckler alum, alumni. Joel will yell at you regularly uh, and tell you um, to follow your dreams all while uh, making sure that you don't waste your life. Uh, you're gonna go different places and in the next ne slide you'll see that after completing your doctoral degree, at NYU, um, you'll go to many different places. You'll live in Chicago, where you were a postdoc at Northwestern. Um, and more importantly, you'll start connect, reconnecting with your roots. You'll, uh, your science will take you places you've never been. You'll go to Hawaii. You'll realize that mountains center you and that perhaps the, the flat landscape of the beautiful city of Chicago perhaps is not where you need to be. Um, so you'll move across the country yet again, uh, El Paso to New York, New York to El Paso, El Paso to Chicago, and Chicago to Los Angeles and California, where you will be able to climb mountains that are right by the ocean, travel to beautiful places to present your work. And I think one of the most important lessons that you'll learn throughout this period is that on the next slide, the family that brought you here and supported you all the way is the most important one. The most important piece of your life is going to be those represented on the next slide. Um, your family, your mother, uh, who was the first in your family to go to college, your dad, who uh, went back to school at the age of 50, your sister, who has given you three beautiful um, kiddos that want to be like you and for whom you want to make science better and more inclusive and equitable. And you won't forget that this group of people is, is the peop are the people that made you who you are. Um, you'll be able to follow your career to become an assistant professor um, and have your own students as are shown in the next slide. You'll have a lab with a fancy microscope that you can stand in front of and people will take really cool pictures. Um, you'll have a group of young women that lead your research group with integrity, uh, with racial consciousness and with equity in mind. And more importantly, you'll be able to give back to the community as a faculty member traveling with students to different areas of the world, uh, specifically to Puerto Rico, to rebuild after the storms that are usually affecting the beautiful country. Um, you'll know that it is this work outside of the classroom and the work that you do inside of the classroom that helps lead those in the future to continue to make science more equitable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paloma, for that compelling story. Um, and we look forward to being able to ask questions um, after this session. I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Dr. Antoinette Nelson. Dr. Nelson um, is currently a fellow at, for the um, American Association for the Advancement of Science. And um, she is going to tell us her story. So thank you so much, Paloma. And we'd like to hear from Dr. Nelson now. Hi, everyone. And especially a warm welcome to our land scholars as you join the Leadership Alliance family. 
Um, as mentioned, I am Dr. Antoinette Nelson, and this is my story. Next slide. So I am a first generation Jamaican American. I was born in Far Rockaway, Queens, New York, and that is me on the left as a happy baby. And I haven't stopped giggling since. <laughs> I spent a lot of my time following my older brother around. And so I learned to argue and fight with the boys and I was very competitive. In my house, we competed with puzzles and math problems. And looking back, that was really how my interest in math and engineering got started. To the right is a picture of me in Jamaica with my aunt. I was there for a summer as I would often go back to visit and I lived there for a few years in my childhood. I remember getting hundreds of mosquito bites and eating mangoes and coconuts that fell out of nearby trees and crying if Someone didn't heat up my bath water on the stove since there was no warm water in the area. It was humble, but another place that I called home. And what these experiences taught me from early was how differently people lived in different parts of the world, in different neighborhoods, different communities. And while the diversity and richness of culture is so beautiful, I understood that just because of where a person was born or where they lived, this could significantly limit their access to resources and ability to achieve their fullest potential. And that it didn't sit right with me. And that was a perspective that fueled my passions and my interests from early and directed much of my life's choices. Next slide. So now fast forward 20 years later, <laughs> this is me at my lands. So by this time, I was a rising senior at Stony Brook University majoring in biomedical engineering. And before this summer, I honestly never considered going for my PhD. I had no clue what that took. My plan was to go to law school. I wanted to become a professional social justice warrior and that was the only way that I knew how. But that summer, I fell in love, in love with research. At Johns Hopkins, we were interested in nanoparticles and their effect on the respiratory system after we inhaled them. We found that based on their surface characteristics, they could disrupt the outermost protective layer in our airways. That was responsible for keeping bad things out and letting good things in. So I began thinking, how can we use this to our advantage? And I obsessed over this and ultimately decided to apply to PhD programs that fall so I could study this topic further. Next. Then at Rutgers University, I spent the next six years of my life engineering the surface characteristics of nanoparticles to disrupt protective cell layers. Except now, it was on purpose and as a drug delivery platform to fight HIV. During this time, I was able to travel the country and the world doing research. In the top left, that is me in Ponce, Puerto Rico, doing a stem cell training. In the middle, that's me in Beijing, China, where I was a student diplomat and a fellow with the National Science Foundation. To the far left, that's me after a dance recital in graduate school with my support circle, my family and friends that came. And in the middle bottom, that's my affirmation wall that got me through many hard days of graduate school and failed experiments and gave me the energy to go in in the morning. And when I graduated from my doctoral program, so that's on the right, my family and friends carpooled and traveled across states to celebrate with me. I was the first in my family to get a PhD. And of course, it would not be a Jamaican celebration if we did not bring at least two flags. Next slide. So after I finished my PhD, the question was what to do next. And for me, I was exhausted, so I rested and I spent a bit of the next year traveling with my best friend. And here are a few of the highlights. We visited the pyramids of Giza in Egypt and the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. And as I mentioned, I originally wanted to go to law school because I wanted to become a better advocate for my community. But along the way, I learned that there are many ways that you can do this. And one was to act directly through public policy. So I applied and was offered to do a congressional internship with the United States Senate Budget Committee and the office of Bernie Sanders, 
where I worked on a number of policy issue areas, including health, education, tax, and foreign policy. And I got to see up close what advocacy looked like within the walls of Congress and in the meetings behind closed doors. This experience deepened my passion for public service. Next slide. And ultimately, I stayed in DC working in the federal public policy space. As mentioned, I'm currently a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow, and I bring my unique experiences as an individual and use my skills as an engineer and scientist to influence and make an impact through federal public policy. At the United States for International Development, I work on programming to address issues of gender equality and empower women globally. I included a news clip from CNN World News that highlights findings from a report that my office commissioned studying the effects of climate change and environmental degradation on communities predominantly of color around the world and incidences of gender-based violence globally. As an executive branch fellow, we work closely with other members of the interagency and the federal government, including officials in the White House. So the picture at the bottom are members of my team with some White House officials you may recognize. After a meeting, regarding women's economic empowerment initiatives and programming at the agency. So here I am now. From a little girl, I believe that we are uniquely crafted and positioned in the world with particular interests and passions and a fire inside that makes us who we are. Your path is your own and no two will look the same. There is a power and necessity in that for us to be able to innovate, contribute to society, and solve the world's greatest challenges. And I want you to know that between each of these smiling photos and every seemingly successful step, there are many tears, frustrated nights, discouraging words from people who did not understand my interests because they didn't fit the preset engineering mold. So I want you to know that no matter what area you are in or aspiring to be in, that there is no mold, there are no boundaries, and there is just a dynamic you. My advice as you continue on through your career and you approach crossroads is that you ask yourself deeply personal questions, listen to your gut and your core, challenge the things around you that don't sit right, and find a path that will best keep the fire inside you lit as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nelson, and we are very much looking forward to hearing your pathway, about your pathway to success. And um, you've obviously had a very rich and fulfilling experience and all of those different opportunities that you've encountered. And so we're looking forward to talking with you more during our Q&A. Our next speaker is Dr. David Castro, manager in the Global Analytical and Microbiological Services Division of Ecolab. So, Dr. Castro, we'd love to hear from you and your story. Thank you. Very good. I think you can see me now. Yes. And you can hear me, hopefully. Yes, Something thank you. happened there with, uh, thank you. Th something happened there with the slide, but we're going to ignore that for a minute. The bar has been set high by the previous speakers, Paloma and Antoinette. I'm not going to show you many pictures for one very simple reason, and that is that I don't have any pictures of myself. Uh, I, I actually, uh, when I froze for a few minutes when this task was upon my hand, on my hands regarding uh, finding pictures. And uh, my wife came to the rescue and found a, a number of pictures of me with which I can tell you a story about where uh, and how I got to where I am today. Again, I am a manager today with, the, with a company called Ecolab. It's a global Fortune 500 company. Uh, we are based uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. I am personally based in Naperville, Illinois, a few miles just west of Chicago. Can we go on to the next slide, please? What you have here is my mother giving me a bath. I don't want to say that this is a cultural experience. I'm going to say that this is family experience. Somehow boys are relevant and important in our family and there are somehow many pictures, that's why we found one, of me naked. Um, there is some, something there covering what shouldn't be seen. I was born in Puerto Rico, Bayamon, many years ago. Spanish is my first language 
And uh, at that time, I'm just looking at my mother as I am feeling what is probably called water. Um, the next slide will show my two older sisters on the left and my mother, and I am right in the middle of that picture. My father had one daughter from one first marriage and then two daughters so we see here from the second marriage. And of course, being the youngest, uh, all of a sudden, here we have a boy that needs to be celebrated as you saw in the previous picture. Um, the second picture on the right is me with the first beer in my hands. It's part of being a man somehow in that kind of environment. Again, I'm gonna claim that that is my family environment. And uh, I guess I drank a little bit of it. I have no memory of this event whatsoever. The good news, uh, or at least different news, I, I, I should say, is that I, I rarely drink any alcohol now as an adult. I don't know why. I don't know if this experience just uh, put me in, the, in, in, a, in, in a situation that, was, that had the opposite effect of what probably my father or my mother were trying to do, which is to make me a man by drinking a beer. And with that, I want to move on to the next slide that shows me much more of a grown up man, that the individual on the left of this picture, and my son Alejandro in that car seat. This is the second day of the month of August of 1999. This, at this point, I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. And my bachelor's degree was a combination of two main things. Um, I went on to study philosophy, and that's how I started. I fell in love not so much with philosophy, but everything that had to do with literature. In fact, the very first semester, the very first thing that I read was the Iliad. And that was captivating for me. I fell in love with it. I, and from that moment on, I started reading like a maniac. I want to emphasize that that was many years ago, but I was a really mature individual. This is 1992 when I started reading a significant amount of stuff. And, and the lesson that I think we can come out of that is that it's never too late. If you haven't started reading the good stuff out there, start. This is, uh, this is a good time to do it. Uh, and then the second part of my bachelor's degree was all that had to do with chemistry. Uh, I was playing around with um, all things in the natural sciences, uh, math, physics, and chemistry. Not so much biology, that was not my stuff. But I ended up basically getting a degree in both of those areas, philosophy and chemistry, and then moving on to the University of Wisconsin in Madison to do a, an advanced degree in chemistry, physical chemistry to be exact. And this day, the 2nd of August of 1999, is the day that we are in the airport. That's where this picture was taken um, to take our plane to land in O'Hare and later on move on to Madison, Wisconsin, where um, the university was. Um, I have always been, at least since, since high school, I have always been a very uh, early morning person, and there I am, uh, probably 7 or 6.30 in the morning in the airport waiting for our flight to take off. And if we go on to the next slide, what you're going to see is me in 2004. So if you do the math, we're talking, this is summer of 2004. This is in Madison, Wisconsin, and I am five years into my PhD program. And um, there's something that happens when you're in graduate school, and that is that you click. Somebody in school taught me that at some point you click. You kind of get it. You get what you're doing in research. You're on top of it. And this picture basically shows how I, I am. I, I, this is basically after I click. I'm on top of my research. I know what I'm doing. I just need one more year, and I'm going to finish my, my advanced degree, PhD in physical chemistry. And, and, and I'm going to tell the world everything there is to know about, here's the title of my thesis, uh, collisions and reactions of N-propanol with sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide. And if you go on to the next slide, you're going to see a picture of me the day before the thesis defense. This is me hiding under, under a pillow, trying to go to sleep. I was never able to go to sleep realizing that at this point there is not much you can do because that precious resource called time has run out and at this point there is no more articles to read there is no more books no more discussions to have with professors about what my degree is about what my thesis defense is about the good news is that the day after i went on to stand in front of this committee i defended my thesis 
I successfully passed and got, got the degree. It was not easy. And the picture on the left shows hubris. The picture on the right shows the realization that we are not uh, infallible. And, um, and sometimes we have to just get under the pillow and sleep it through a little bit, but go on the next day you get up and go on to defend your thesis. This is the final slide that I'm showing here. Uh, on the bottom right is a presentation that I did uh, in 2018 at a conference called Tissue World. I was working at the time in the paper, pulp and paper industry. And we were, I was given a presentation about the decomposition of paper in water. Why is it that relevant? That is relevant because there are many, many legal cases in court right now uh, where municipal uh, water treatment uh, facilities are fighting against paper companies and other companies in the world, given what we're putting down our sewer system. In other words, what you're flushing down the toilet. Yes, I, scientists work with this kind of stuff as well. It so happens that the, that the two major uh, components that go into the decomposition of paper in water is the type of fiber and the chemistry involved in that. Um, I am, if anything, bringing this example up because the sky's the limit. The uh, number of things that we work with is endless. Uh, the topics are endless. It is a, uh, an agreement among us research in the paper industry when we work in tissue and towel, not to tell our, our spouses about it um, because sometimes it's embarrassing, but uh, here, here I am talking about it to a big audience. My wife on the top left, Amanda, um, um, giving me some company here in the top of the mountains in Colorado. This is a beautiful place we were visiting a few weeks ago. The sky's the limit. Um, this, uh, this job and my current job has taken me to many different places. And uh, even though it has taken to me to many places, I decided to make a switch from research and into management. And about uh, for the past four years or so, I have been um, in the management uh, role. Uh, and then for the past year, I have been full time in a manager role in uh, a company called Ecolab, again, that some of you have heard about uh, more than anything else recently with this pandemic. With that, I want to say thank you very much to the Leadership Alliance for the opportunity. My experience in 1998 was a stepping stone, if not a catapult, to where I am today. Uh, many thanks to, to the Leadership Alliance again for that support. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Castro. Um, and we are very much interested in hearing about your, your struggles and your journey. And we already have a few questions for you. Um, However, with that, I would like to welcome our final panelist, Dr. Orly Clerget, who is the Assistant Professor of um, Department of Sociology at UC Davis. So thank you so much, Dr. Clerget. If you could please um, tell us your story, it will be much appreciated. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, a special hello to all of the land scholars who completed or in the process, are in the process of completing their summer experience under extraordinarily challenging circumstances that are going on, not only in our country, but also our world. Um, my name is uh, Orly Clerget, and I'm a sociology professor at the University of California, Davis. I completed a fantastic Leadership Alliance summer experience at Columbia University in the School of Public Health in 2003, 17 years ago. Uh, with the remarkable Dr. Luisa Borel on racial disparities in infant mortality. Next slide, please. So I'm going to reveal a little bit about my elder millennial status here. As you'll see, many of the images in my presentation will either come from um, my family albums or my Instagram page. So my parents are Haitian immigrants and I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York in the 1980s. This is my mom who I'm very close to and love very much in our Brooklyn apartment. Um, I grew up in Flatbush, Brooklyn. I'm the youngest of six children, um, and here is an image all the way to the right of my first passport. And like many children who were growing up in the global landscape of New York, um, I came of age in a transnational household. And so we spent a lot of time um, in the summer 
during the summer, traveling to Haiti uh, to visit siblings as well as family. The city of New York and my travels abroad are really a significant part of not only my cultural identity, but they've also shaped my research interests in decolonial sociology, in issues of race and racism and political resistance, migration, as well as urban studies. Next slide, please. My journey to the professoriate was a winding road, uh, like many of us. I went to Catholic school from kindergarten to eighth grade. I graduated from one of New York's failing public high schools called uh, Sheepset Bay High School, which is um, since closed since I graduated. The tide then turned for me when I received a posse full tuition scholarship to attend Wheaton College in North, Norton, Massachusetts. I began graduate school at the University of Michigan in 2005 uh, for a PhD in sociology. However, after a semester, I left. I returned to New York to work at the Russell Sage Foundation, a social science research think tank, uh, and com then completed my PhD in sociology and social demography at Brown University in 2013. The day I graduated from Brown, I completed one journey and actually began another. My then dear partner, Danny, who was completing his doctorate at Columbia University Teachers College, uh, proposed and we married a year later, uh, the day of my graduation. Uh, here is an image of my origin family. So those are my five siblings as well as my uh, parents. And to the right is the image of uh, my new family, which I gained on my graduation day, which was my husband. It was definitely a full full day. Next slide, please. After completing my degree at Brown, I went on to do a one-year postdoc at Yale University with the Urban Ethnography um, Lab. And after being at Yale for one year, I started my first real job at the age of 31. Yes, the road to the professoriate is a, is a long one. I spent most of my 20s in school. Um, I started at Tufts as an assistant professor uh, in sociology and Africana studies, and Tufts is located in New England and Massachusetts. Um, and I spent four remarkable years at Tufts. And one of my favorite things about living uh, in Massachusetts and for three out of the four years on campus uh, working as a scholar in residence um, was the fall foliage. So that's, in, that's an image on the slide there. Next slide, please. In 2018, uh, in, in the midst of working on my book manuscript, I moved cross country to start a job at the University of California, Davis. So essentially I traded in my East Coast fast paced vibes for uh, Cali's more laid back culture. Here is an image of me doing a presentation this past year at the 50th anniversary of the Afri African American Studies program here at the University of California, Davis. This was pre-COVID. Next slide, please. Last year, I published my first sole authored book called The New Noir, Race, Identity, and Diaspora in Black Suburbia with the University of California uh, Press. And the book is based on my ethnography of Black suburbs in Queens and Long Island, New York. In the book, I explore the cultural identities of Black Americans, Haitians, and Jamaicans who are in the middle class. And I argue that Black migrants and immigrants created vibrant diasporic suburbs in spite of issues of white supremacy and housing, education, and work. The book was written in multiple cities, multiple cafes, many restaurants, and home offices. And although I don't have any children, um, completing the book and write, writing the book and completing it was both the hardest and the most rewarding thing um, that I ever completed and at the end felt like giving birth. Next slide, please. So there have been many challenges on the journey to the PhD and the professoriate for me. And there are too many to cover, obviously, in this short presentation. Um, I love my family dearly. Um, and unfortunately, we've been hit by um, many family illnesses. This image to the lower left is one of my siblings and I as we waited for my mother, um, who was on life support the same year that I was completing a postdoc. And more recently, my mom was ill with COVID, but by the grace of God, she is a warrior and she's in recovery. Also, being a graduate student was hard as a working class woman and being black and having your bank account 
sometimes, more often times than it should be in the red, um, was a real, it was real life for me at the end of every month. Graduate school, you receive, um, you know, a limited stipend and you have to make it stretch. Um, also, the workload and competitive environment of graduate school brought many highs and lows of physical and, and psychological stress and posed many challenges for maintaining, maintaining relationships. And lastly, because I am a Black woman and uh, the children of immigrants have had to confront racism, sexism, um, and xenophobia at every turn. So the journey, the journey is not always roses and it's not always smiles and graduation caps. Next slide, please. And more than anything, the life of the mind is an individual race, a marathon of sorts. Next slide, please. When I, when I completed my PhD and uh, really began quote unquote adulting, uh, I learned how to manage stress um, and the loneliness of, of the experience and, and I found ways to bring sustained joy into my life. Pre-COVID, traveling the world um, with family and friends really sustained me. This is an image of my husband and I um, in Alexandria, Egypt in 2018. Um, when in place, physical fitness is an important outlet and stress reliever. And that's obviously something I really enjoy doing with um, dear friends, dear women friends in particular. Next slide, please. I've also had a lot of help along the way from mentors, uh, advisors, friends, um, family, and especially many, many home cooked meals to help me stay physically strong um, through, through the journey. Next slide, please. So the road to the professoriate has been one of many highs and lows. However, I wanna tell my younger self to remember that there is a way to not only survive this process and journey, but to also thrive. And one way to do this is to know that um, you're an original and you're not a copy. And to remember always that it's important to stay rooted in where you come from. Secondly, although the current global pandemic has created incre incredible uncertainties and stress, it's important to remember that we'll get to the other side of this. And as Nas said, the world is yours. It's yours to shape, it's yours to mold, it's yours to recreate, um, and it's yours to shake up. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Clerget. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists for getting so personal and sharing your journey um, and how you got here. Uh, we do have a few questions in the Q&A. And I think the first question actually um, can be applied to all of our speakers. So um, I'm going to ask the question and then we can ask each, each one of our panelists to respond. What do you recall as one of the struggles you had pursuing your professional career and what did you learn from it? Um, let's start with Dr. Cliche since you just finished up. Thank you. Um, I think one of the, the main challenges that I experienced early on um, as a new assistant professor was time management. I thought that as a graduate student, I really had time management um, um, down as a, as a skill. However, when you become an assistant professor um, and you have to manage not only your research, but also teaching and service, uh, it becomes a new ball game. Um, and so I really benefited from being a part of the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. I believe they also have a dissertation boot camp for graduate students. Um, and they provided many, many uh, tools, including uh, tips and strategies for uh, managing your time when it just felt like 24 um, hours in a day is, is, is not enough. Um, and I credit that organization which, with really uh, opening my mind up to all of the, um, all of the different avenues and uh, possibilities that assistant professors can take to be successful uh, in academia and to uh, achieve tenure. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vargas, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, struggles pursuing a professional career. Um, 
I really, I really struggled in trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, I originally wanted to be a physician and then went into grad school and, and for a hot minute there, um, I was convinced that I was going to go into biotech or big pharma. Um, and it wasn't until I actually started, um, TA for a course in grad school that I really, um, kind of figured out that I really enjoyed teaching and, you know, what, what does teaching mean in, in the context of academia is, is being a professor, right? And um, that wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to do kind of the, the, this, the support side of things where I could provide students with resources and maybe run a center um, similar to, to the center that they have, the science center that's at Brown um, and, and really kind of provide that support for students that goes beyond what we do in the classroom. And I didn't know how to do that. Um, so I asked a lot of questions um, and I failed a lot. Um, I did a, a, you know, did my PhD at NYU and then um, there were a lot of failed experiments. So I, I really appreciate Antoinette uh, or Dr. Nelson bringing that up of failed experiments. And then um, Dr. Clerge of, you know, talking about you know, what do you do as, a, as an assistant professor right, is, is managing your time and trying to figure out how do you balance scholarship and service and teaching and do them all seemingly well, right? And so those that have um, tenure and that have, have gone through that process, uh, especially people of color, I, I really commend them because it is a struggle. It is, it is hard and you fall flat on your face a lot of times, or at least I do. I don't want to say that about our other panelists because they all seem amazing and fantastic, but you fail a lot. And so I think learning from those failures and being able to accept the fact that you're going to fail um, that everything's not going to be perfect is, is really important and a really important lesson to learn that you're going to fail and that's okay. Um, and it's what you do with that failure that is going to be meaningful. Um, so I think, I think that's what I've learned from it. Thank you, Dr. Vargas. Um, Dr. Nelson, would you like to enlighten us? You mentioned there were some tough times in between all of those happy photos you shared. So um, we'd like to hear about your struggles as well. Woo, which struggle, right? <laughs> um, I would say when I was earlier, so um, earlier on, so in undergrad and um, younger, my biggest struggle during that time was probably um, I needed to stop telling myself no. Um, it took me a while to, um, to, I guess, to get the courage to apply for certain things and to be able to deal with the, the possibility of rejection. Um, and so I think and, and that's part of what I discussed when I said that my time at Land really kind of changed everything for me. Um, I think that was the first experience. To be honest, when I applied for Leadership Alliance, I applied for um, three different schools. I put Johns Hopkins at the top, but I didn't expect, I only did that just to like let my dad know like, okay, I tried to put something at the top that I ideally would have wanted, but I really wanted to go to my second choice university. That's where I thought I would end up. Um, and then I ended up getting into Johns Hopkins and I was actually, I read that email like three, four times. I was like, I didn't believe so because they were number one um, in the country in my, for my major at the time. So I was, I was pretty shocked. Um, but that experience and then going there and seeing people who looked like me who were in the sciences and doing PhDs, that was the first time that I really thought that I could, I could do that as well. Um, so I think once, once I learned to stop telling myself no. After that, I apply for everything, anything that looks a little bit interesting to me, or I think I have enough of the qualifications. You don't need all. I apply for everything and let someone else tell me no through a process. Um, I will never tell myself no. So I think that was an early struggle that I had to get over. Um, it doesn't hurt to, to try. And I think similar to, um, what Dr. Vargas was saying about trying to figure out um, what exactly you wanted to do. So as I mentioned, I, I felt that my interest seemed a little bit different than, um, I guess, with stereo, stereotypically what engineers were doing um, or interested in. And typically we're told, at least in my areas, you know, you go to work for big pharma, 
um, you become a professor or you start your own business. Like those were kind of the three options. Um, and I knew that none of those were really for me. And going through as um, a number of the panelists mentioned, the PhD process is extremely, um, you know, it is, it is rough. It is a, a long process that you need support you need like outside mentors, you need whatever you can to get you through that process. And through that, through those challenges, what I really learned was that I wanted a life that when I woke up in the morning that I was extremely passionate about what I was doing and that I never had to pull myself out of bed um, to get into the lab. So, so I took the time um, the year after, like I said, to really explore, to ask myself some serious questions and to figure out where the areas were that I could really combine my interests in science and research um, with some of the, the more social aspects um, and work that I was doing in the community that I was really passionate about. Um, yes, yeah, so I, think, I think the challenge with that was really listening to the people outside who were like, what are you doing? You're supposed to go to biotech. You're supposed to become a teacher. You're supposed to, or start, you're only supposed to do these three things. What are you doing? Um, and listening to that for some time because it takes a while before everything comes together and all the dots make sense for other people to see. So having to, to withstand and have the strength to go through that, that was a challenge. But I just wanna say now that I'm on the other side doing stuff that I'm really passionate about and now people understand the steps that I was taking, um, it is so rewarding and I'm happy I was able to do that. Um, but yeah, but that's the challenge and that's why I stress is really listening to your gut and knowing inside like who you are, what makes you tick and then doing the, the internal searching to find out what will make you happy in your career. Thank you for sharing. Dr. Castro, would you like to tell us a little bit about your struggles in your experience? Yes. Let's see if I can get my video started here. Sorry for that. Oh, I am blocked from doing it. So I'm going to try to say, uh, oh, I have a message here about starting my video. I'm sorry. Get it. Okay. Very good. Um, I, I, I have one idea regarding struggles um, and, and you can think about it in many, um, many stages or if anything, the entire range of my time, particularly in, in school, whether it's undergraduate or graduate degree. And there is something out there called imposter syndrome. I suffered from it. I cannot say I suffer from it right now, but I did suffer from it. And, um, and when I hear um, when I hear the other speakers, when I hear other people, particularly from underrepresented groups like ours, like mine, uh, it happens all over the place. Uh, and it's this idea, and feeling that you don't belong, that you are, and I, and this is one that really um, comes to the core in my own experience. The the idea articulated itself in, I am not as smart as everybody else in this group. And you're surrounded by this really smart professors. You're surrounded by this really smart graduate students. And you're wondering again and again and again, do I belong there? And, and the answer really comes at some point from yourself. And you basically say, yes, I belong. I belong where I am. I am as smart as anybody else, probably not smarter or not dumber, but you're certainly as smart as everybody else. And, and when, you, when you affirm that in your own experience, you start to move on. You start to actually put those fears and anxieties to the side and, and concentrate on, on those things that matter, at least at the moment. Um, there's an exam, there is an experiment that you have to do. Uh, you go ahead and do the exam, do the best you can, work hard for it. You go and do that experiment and you're gonna fail a thousand times and a thousand and first time it may work out not necessarily the same way that you were doing it before, but that's actually what research is about. This is what the investigation process is about. And the point is that, and the lesson from all that, of course, is that you can expand that idea to the rest of the world and the rest of your, the, the life that you live. Um, and my advice here is get involved uh, once, you, particularly when you get out of graduate school. I mean, for me, graduate school was graduate school and nothing else, but once I got out of graduate school, I have a life beyond where I can tell myself I, I belong here, I can work here, I can contribute. There are a thousand activities across the community where I live 
And, and of course, I cannot, I don't have enough time and energy for all those activities, but I get involved in a few that are sufficient for, um, for me to, to, to develop and contribute back to the community around me. So, so again, the imposter syndrome is out there. Many of us suffer from it. Sometimes we have to stop ourselves and say, enough, you know, I belong here. Let's move on. Let's, let's go ahead and achieve the goals that we have set ourselves to, to achieve. Thank you. Uh, our next question is for Dr. Nelson. Uh, Dr. Nelson, how do you recommend getting involved with advocacy political groups when you are majoring in science? Um, I guess the, one of the first things that comes to mind is that there are a number of scientific societies. And so, for example, as right now, I'm a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow. Um, that is a scientific society that that is a scientific society that is focused on um, public public service and advocacy, and they're really involved um, with like different kind of Capitol Hill days and things like that. So you can look whether through AAAS or through the societies. For example, I was part of um, Biomedical Engineering Society, where they have some similar um, programs and activities as well, and I'm sure in the other fields they do. Um, and also within my program, a number of the other, um, like the physical societies and different ones, I'm not sure of the name since they're not um, my area, but they're very active within our programming and sending um, fellows at different levels to work at Capitol Hill and different parts of the government. Um, I think the question said too, as far as like majoring in science, I would also challenge you to think, um, not, just, not just thinking from the, um, the box of being a major, in a science major. Um, there are so many ways that just you as an individual can get involved and who you are as a science person, a scientist coming from a science lens will always come with you no matter where you are. So for example, um, as I mentioned, there are congressional internships. So they are in Washington, DC, you can apply for them. You can apply within your local state. There are also local level activities that you can do with your, um, your state so not your US state senator, but your actual state senator. So in your local communities, um, your congressmen and your local assemblymen um, in, the, in the areas where you live. So there are a number of activities. So for example, I was also a um, community liaison for my New York state senator for a summer as well. Um, and they, they literally, the office is like down the block from me. I would walk like 10 minutes there and I would help with a lot of local activities um, community support programming and um, educational programming in the community and doing things like that. So there are so many different ways um, at the local level, at the broader national level to get involved. And as I mentioned, through society, science societies, but also just you being a person and reaching out. And there are always opportunities for volunteers and they need help. They often need help. So. Thank you. Um, this question is also for you, Dr. Nelson, and you kind of touched on this a little bit, but how do you combine your more scientific background with public service? Um, and what did you work on specifically with Senator Sanders? Um, so as I mentioned, when I was on, when I was with um, the Office of Senator Sanders and the U.S. Budget Committee, um, I worked on a variety of different areas. So a bit of health policy. So I was there during the time of the introduction of Medicare for All, mostly as an intern, mostly helping with a bit of like the research um, work to go into that, um, as well as administrative support. And then I was really involved with education policy. Um, with a lot of these activities, as far as my science being used, I would say in the main areas, it was really within um, a lot of rapid research projects we had to complete. So for example, if there, if there was a hearing that was occurring and there maybe was a person that would come to testify from an agency um, or wherever, and the, the different senators will now have to, you know, ask these individuals various questions. Um, after the hearing is done, you'll have follow-up questions where you submit to the individual who now he needs to respond back in written correspondence and answer these questions. And so sometimes doing um, opposition, oppositional research um, and, and analyzing some of the, the policies that are proposed and coming from a, 
a scientific research lens and applying that in the area. Um, they're really, as I mentioned, I think, I, I guess I want to challenge us to think about um, when you are a scientist, like that is just who you are. So when I'm in those rooms and um, a topic comes up, it's just it, the lens that I bring to it is from my experience as a scientist and from my training as a scientist. Um, so it happens in many ways that I don't even realize, but um, that's how, how I would apply it in a question. Well, but I hope I answered it. Yes, thank you. Um, so we have one final question. Um, we're going to start with Dr. Castro since it was directed to him specifically, but this person also wants to hear from the remainder of the panel as well. So, um, Dr. Castro, how did you figure out what your your career, um, how, how did you figure out what area you wanted to go into as far as, you know, pursuing your career um, and what your research focus would be? So I get that uh, question very often, particularly because of um, having gone directly from graduate school into um, industry. And uh, the funny thing about it is that if you think, of, if you think about certain other careers, and the best example I have is law, uh, when you, somebody studies law, when somebody says in law school, you don't ask that person whether he or she um, is, is going to be a professor. Actually, most of our assumption is that that individual is going to practice law out in the field. That person is going to out, go out into some community and practice law, so whatever that is. Well, it so happens that there are many more uh, careers that are like that. Uh, chemistry is one of them. There are many companies out there looking for, uh, first and foremost, thinking individuals, second, certain uh, preparation background, uh, technical background in this case. And um, it, it was, I, I like the academic environment, uh, but I was ready to move on from that. I cannot say that I had a lot of experience, uh, that I had an, a lot of knowledge of what industry was, but I knew that um, I wanted to, to try it out. So, so I kind of uh, went into it, not necessarily with a huge amount of background and knowledge of what it was, but I, I, I went in nonetheless. Uh, one of the things that happens, and, and this is probably the biggest difference between industry uh, research and um, academic research. In academic research, you yourself uh, determine what the research path, the research topic is you manage that and and that is one of the main aspects very appealing aspect of what is called in, in academic uh environments uh self-governance uh and and that is that is just fine it's, it, it works and uh and it's a very good thing uh the, the the industry is a little bit different industry has uh research big research departments like our company and we have very specific problems that we need to solve in other words those problems come to us once those problems come to us, the way we address those problems are, are basically up to us. And that's where our ingenuity and our creativity comes in, um, in solving and addressing those, those problems. So um, all I'm trying to say is that there is not much of a mystery uh, in, in the jump into industry. And uh, the, the one thing that I, I can tell everybody is uh, go ahead, look out and see what else is out there beyond the academic environment. The academic environment comes to us more naturally because that's where we are, is relatively well known to us. But there's a world out there uh, that is looking for people that um, more, first and foremost uh, have a thinking head above their shoulders. That's, that's the most important thing. And then they're looking for some background, uh, sometimes technical, sometimes in some other areas. It doesn't have to be any of the classical chemistry, physics, and stuff like that. So um, I hope that that more or less answers the question. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Vargas, would you like to address the question? Yeah, sure. Um, so just to repeat the question, um, how do we choose our research focus? And uh, how did you figure out uh, what you wanted to do for your career. Um, I mentioned earlier that I, I wasn't really sure um, what I wanted to do career-wise. And for me, I found a path that incorporates both um, administrative uh, work where I can change policies and address systemic barriers at my institution and also teach within the classroom setting. 
Um, I am a microbiologist by training or medical and molecular parasitologist. Um, I was at the NYU School of Medicine that had the, the only parasitology department in the country at the time. There are different ones now. Um, but I knew, um, actually this, this is Joel Oppenheim's fault is really uh, what it is. Um, Joel Oppenheim was, um, I told him I worked on, on monarch butterflies and he said, well, we don't, we don't have any of that kind of research at um, the School of Medicine, um, but we do have labs that work with mosquitoes. Um, so I, I actually did one of my research internships at a malaria lab um, and really just got sucked into the idea of parasitic diseases um, and how they function, what they do and how they're, they're regulated at a molecular level. Um, and then that kind of has transformed in, in some ways um, to look at how these diseases disproportionately affect communities of color um, and people from disenfranchised groups. So um, it's been a journey. Um, I, I'm also working, I have a second branch of my research that really uh, focuses on access for historically ma marginalized students in higher education and the impacts of Hispanic serving institutions in that um, development and and support of students but it's a it's a process you know you can and, and one of the beautiful things about having uh the training that we all have uh, as your panelists is that we all have this doctoral training that really what it trains you for is to be able to think critically and to assess and and as dr nelson mentioned bringing that scientific mind into a space um, and then being able to use that scientific mind or that scientific processing and reasoning to address a variety of different questions. So don't feel like, you know, if you choose something today that that's the thing that you have to stay in forever. Um, I think that's changing as, as we go on. So that's kind of how I uh, created my niche, but um, you know, it's still changing. I, I you know, I, I never looked at COVID before. Um, and now, you know, my students are looking, looking at bioinformatic data and health disparity data related to COVID and some of the receptors of, of the virus. And that's certainly something that I didn't expect to be doing, you know, even a year ago, even four months ago. So be open-minded. Thank you, Dr. Vargas. Um, Dr. Clerche. Uh, so, yes, the question is how exactly did I figure out my research focus and then my career focus? Um, I often say that uh, my research, um, which is, I, I'm an urban sociologist and I do research on um, black migration, black immigration, issues of racial identity um, um, and cultural identity uh, within you know, urban and suburban spaces. Um, and as I was completing my book project, I realized that um, I didn't necessarily choose my research focus. I think my research really chose me. And what I mean by that is growing up in New York City and growing up in um, a hyper segregated black neighborhood, I learned very early on at a very early age what urban inequality meant, right? It was a part of my lived experience. And so with that kind of personal um, background, my biography, I was able to ask questions that others who didn't grow up perhaps in the kind of neighborhood that I grew up or um, grew up in the kind of uh, transnational family that I grew up, they probably wouldn't be asking. Um, and so that's the kind of lens that I bought into the classroom when I was in college. Um, and I also uh, had the opportunity to um, have mentors who were phenomenal examples of who I could become as a professor. Um, one mentor, her name is uh, Michelle Ann Harris, and she taught um, sociology at Wheaton College, and she uh, exposed me to Marxist theory um, and um, uh, theories of race and racism, et cetera, right? which, which was really a formative part of my experience. In terms of how exactly I chose my career, when I entered graduate school, um, I knew that I wanted to do sociology, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that in the non-academic sphere or if I was going to go into academia. I was always open to 
uh, working at the census, right? Being in there and, and crunching numbers. I was also exploring opportunities in marketing. Uh, and going to Brown was uh, a unique experience because folks who graduated from Brown sociology uh, went into different um, um, career paths. So it was definitely a possibility. And then also um, being a sociologist who uh, was also a social demographer uh, made that, um, made that a, you know, a, a potential pathway pathway for me, non-academic non career. So I don't have a beautiful kind of inspirational story about becoming a, a professor. I think that um, I just applied for many jobs um, my last year in graduate school and I, I got lucky. My first job at Tufts was the only job um, that uh, I, I received, job offer that I received uh, back in 20, 2013. Um, right before I graduated. And so I said, well, this is um, an opportunity and I'm going to explore it. And as challenging as it was, I realized that that's exactly where I needed to be in academia, doing what my mom said at my graduation I would do, which is uh, help many others uh, get their education um, and support them along that pathway because I had so many people who had done the same for me. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Nelson? Okay, um, so that is, that is a long answer as well, but I'll try to, <laughs> to shorten it. So for the first question about um, how did I choose my area of research? So I mentioned a bit about um, finding a, a love for nanotechnology um, during my time at LANS. And so that was more of the, like the technical part of engineering that I, I fell in, um, in love with and had an interest in. And when I got to graduate school and I looked at the different labs that were working um, in the nanotechnology space, you could then choose um, you know, individual advisors based on the specific diseases um, or what conditions they were working on to help address. So the um, advisor I ended up um, connecting with, he worked in different areas. He worked in cancer, um, counterterrorism, and then also in HIV. And so um, for me, as I mentioned, having a, you know, like a passion for social justice and, and wanted to do work that really impacted um, communities of color, I ended up deciding that I wanted to do work within the HIV space because I knew it was something that I could be really passionate about. Um, and then as I continued to build a career, I wanted to make sure that there, within research labs or um, various parts of the HIV, um, advocacy space that I could be another person um, that looks like the community that is heavily affected by it. So that was one of the, the, um, the, the thoughts behind me trying and deciding to go into that space. Um, as far as career overall, um, I, and this is why it was a little bit tricky for me because the way I think about my career is I really think about things much more in a sense of, of purpose. So my first my first question to myself was more of what do I want to accomplish like while I'm alive and on this earth? Like what are the things that bother me that I want to use my career and dedicate it in some kind of way to fix? So I, I asked myself these questions and then there were so many different things. And so I spent time until I figured out where exactly I wanted to, to go and blend it together. I spent the time really, um, filling in filling in the gaps with additional knowledge. So for example, I, I knew that I wanted to have a, um, a hand in like technology development to help develop interventions for, um, for underserved, under-resourced under communities. And so I got my, my training in engineering. Um, after that, I wanted to understand a bit of the policy space. Um, I didn't know how these things were gonna connect. I just knew that it was something I wanted to understand because it, the policy space was a, and individuals in the policy space were um, significant actors into, into funding, into a variety of things. Um, at the time, I didn't even know what these things were, but I knew I wanted to understand more. So I wanted to go into the policy realm to get a better understanding of how it connects with the science and research world. Um, understanding once again that within the HIV space, um, globally, women are um, disproportionately impacted and that there are a variety of social, um, 
social structures that help um, to enforce that disproportionality. And so I wanted to get a better understanding of gender dynamics and power dynamics and how these things worked globally in different parts of the world and how they, um, they affected um, HIV, the, the fight against HIV and, um, and successful treatment. And so I currently now in my position, that was part of the reasons why I chose my current placement was to really get more coming from a very technical background of engineering, trying to get more of an understanding of the social sides and, and aspects to international development and um, just to broaden my perspective. And so um, actually I'll be um, starting in September, I'll be transitioning to a new office where I'll be specifically in the office of HIV AIDS. So working on um, developing research technologies um, that are specifically targeted for women um, internationally, mostly within Sub-Saharan Africa. So it kind of all came together and that is like my dream position that I couldn't have I would have thought it up, but I didn't even know it existed um, some years ago. And I just kind of kept moving and filling in the gaps and just trusting that there was a place out there for me that had all of my passions in one place. Um, yeah, and just, just having the faith, like I said, when people were like, what are you doing? You need to figure it out. Um, but just kind of going and filling in my gaps personally so that I could be impactful whenever I found what that looked like, and I did. And it's out there for everyone, it just, it does take time. and lots of informational interviews, talking to people, figuring it out, but there are those places out there. So that was how I figured it out. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. And thank you to all of our panelists, again, for getting so personal and sharing your stories. Um, over the past eight weeks during our professional development series, I've been moderating conversations with leadership alumni, doctoral scholars, and I can tell you that the students are very appreciative of your personal stories and um, you know, are very interested in hearing about how you got where you are. So thank you very much. Um, and also for dedicating and volunteering your time. With that, I would like to uh, reannounce Dr. Yi, and she is going to um, walk us through the remainder of the itinerary for the symposium. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us and we hope that the plenary session uh, was informative and that you had a great time. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Bingham Hickman, and to Dr. Castro, Dr. Clerge, Dr. Nelson, Dr. Vargas. You know, when we say our mission is to develop underrepresented students into outstanding leaders and role models in all career sectors, this is what we're talking about. You exemplify that mission and you know, I was, first of all, extremely proud of all that you've accomplished and all that you will continue to accomplish. And I was so inspired by all of your stories, your journeys, your ups and downs, your valleys, your challenges, your successes. Um, I think that what you're doing is wonderful and you know, what is really amazing is that through your social justice approach um, to your scholarship and to your research, you are able to amplify your voices against injustice and engage in a relentless pursuit of excellence and innovation. And we cannot thank you enough for your commitment to coming back and giving back and serving in the Leadership Alliance. And so I just invite all of our participants to connect with them. Um, we have leadershipalliance.connect.org so that you can continue the conversation with them and learn more about their career paths. I hope everyone also had a better understanding of all the variety of careers you can have with the PhD. Um, and we're going to continue the conversation. We have an exciting program over the next couple of days. So the end of the plenary is the beginning of wonderful series of oral and poster presentations. So here's what's happening. So tomorrow, please sign in and invite your family and friends to join. Um, at three o'clock, we will have students doing poster presentations until 4 p.m. And then we'll have oral presentations from 4 to 5 p.m. The times are in Eastern time. 
And then we're going to continue the presentations on Saturday. So please come back and join us for all presentations from 3 to 5 p.m. on Saturday. And just as a reminder, we invite you to check the agenda. It has all the links to all of the sessions that will be shared sort of in the chat window. And all the instructions are on the agenda on how to participate. So now as we come to a close, um, I want you to know how delighted we are that you joined us for this plenary kickoff, kicking off VLANs 2020. And we look forward to seeing you in the breakout rooms to keep the conversations going beyond the next two days. So please, again, keep in touch with us on leadershipalliance.connect.org. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd be more than happy to connect with you. As you participate in the presentations and professional development activities and networking during the presentations, I encourage all of our students to envision your future self as the next scientist, professor, scholar, entrepreneur, policymaker, industry leader, who will get into good trouble by standing up for what it's right, for what's right. And I feel as though that, you know, in honor of the great late Congressman John Lewis, um, that it's appropriate to end the session with words from him. He penned an essay that appeared in the New York Times, and I just wanted to share this with you. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. Have a wonderful VLANs. I hope to see you in the presentations tomorrow. Stay connected to the Leadership Alliance. Be safe, stay well, and continue on. Thank you so much for joining. We look forward to continuing to mentor you and be with you after the, after the presentations. Thanks, everyone.